um, you guys are a little bit louder than the, the last crew. Everyone was so like quiet and subdued like in the, the last service. And, you know, I didn't understand why, you know, has anything strange been going on in our world in the North, Northwest? It's been kind of a crazy season, hasn't it? Uh, a few of you guys agree with me or people are like, no, it's not been crazy. Um, man, it's been really interesting. I, I am actually um, going to shift my sermon this week. Um, we're still going to stay in Philippians. We've been going through the book of Philippians, but I just, I just felt like, uh, I, I felt there's, a, there's kind of a uh, fog of fear in our culture right now. And in the book of Philippians, which is the book we're studying, Paul actually addresses this. He really uh, casts vision for a church in northern Greece in the, the colony and town of Philippi. He casts vision for how uh, the church is to be and respond to uh, the challenges and needs that, that hit our world. And I don't know if you guys have paid attention to your face Google book or you know, if you're online at all or with family members and word of mouth, like there's a lot of fear out there right now, right? So um, we're going to jump into the text. We're going to be doing a little bit different text than I'd planned, but we'll come back to where we were going to be preaching next week. Sound good? So we're just jumping a little bit ahead. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians um, chapter three, I believe. Let me uh, make sure I have the right deal. Um, and if you would, uh, you can also follow along behind me, uh, Philippians chapter three, verse 20 and 21. That's where we're going to kind of launch out of. Um, and we, in light of COVID-19, we're going to be just addressing how does the church respond in times like this? Um, verse 20, it says this, our citizenship is in heaven. We look forward to a savior that comes from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, he will transform our humble bodies so that they are like his glorious body. You know, like as I'm getting older, I kind of look forward to having a glorified body uh, more than my, you know, like uh, my weakening body these days, especially with kids, man. Like I've got this little two and a half year old and this like seven year old beast of a girl like who will just jump on me from behind and all of my back aches. When you're getting toward that 35, 40, like the aches change. I mean, you got some things to look forward to if you're like 25, 30. I mean, it's going to be wonderful. But man, the aches and, and pains, I can, I'm looking forward to having a glorified body rather than this humbled body right now. But uh, you do with what you can while you have it. So in, in this verse, it says, he will transform our humble bodies so that they are like his glorious body, body by the power that also makes him able to sub subject all things to himself. Um, Paul's really getting at this reality that Jesus is king. And here at Whitewater, Jesus is at the center. We're a Jesus-centered church. We take all of our, our ethical, our, t our spiritual, our relational cues, our learning, our modeling from Jesus. Like, if we wanna know what God looks like, we look to Jesus. If we wanna know what our life looks like as it's growing into a flourishing life with God, it's gonna look more and more like Jesus. None of us are perfect. God isn't asking for perfect disciples. He's asking asking for growing disciples, but the key to a life where you're beginning to grow in Jesus, even if you're exploring faith or you've been a Christian for 90 years, the key is learning that Jesus is Lord. He's king. He's the, he's the king of the kingdom. And he unleashed in this world through his death and resurrection this new reality. And, and it's, it's something that we need to be reminded of. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. That our, our, our identity, our uh, sense of who we are, our empowerment, our sense of freedom, our sense of reality, our vision for life, all comes from King Jesus who is king of a kingdom. It's the kingdom of light. We're citizens there. And we live in a world where like humans, we like to think that we're in control or can be in control. And humanity is, we've invented all kinds of crazy cool things. I mean, we've had people master uh, so technology and we're able to, to use energy from the earth. We, we use solar energy, wind energy, water energy. We have oil energy. We have all kinds, nuclear energy. And you just think about the atoms that are split to create energy so that we can have light. And you know, there's debates on what, how we the energy, but we are in a culture and a world where we are, we're harnessing the world around us. But here's the most interesting thing. Imagine that you had an atom in your hand, just an atom. You, you couldn't even see it, right? Just one atom in your hand. Think about how much power is in that one atom. 
There is not one person, not one nation that could conjure or create the power of, that's held in that one thing. They couldn't create it. We're just using and stewarding what's already there. That one atom is amongst millions and millions and millions that fill up this universe that have all been created by God. And we are citizens of his good kingdom. It's not our kingdom, it's his kingdom. Amen? I think it's a good reminder that we serve that good God who is the God of all energy, all love, all life. We are citizens in heaven. The reason Paul uses that picture is really important. Uh, uh, it's, there's a cultural reality. Philippi was a colony of Rome. Philippi was a colony of Rome. It actually was, was started by some generals that had uh, huge armies, two generals that had huge armies, and Rome was afraid of them coming back and usurping the, the Caesar, the leader there. So they, they, they kept them out in Philippi, and they said, Would you, you're going to start a colony because we don't want you to come and take over, and we'll give you lots of privileges. So their job as a colony was to colonize northern Greece with the culture, the values, and the life of Rome. They're a Roman um, colony bringing Roman culture to northern Greece. And Paul uses that reality of the church in Philippi. They all knew that they were part of this colony that was represented by Rome. He says to them, he says, you are a colony within a colony. You're a colony of light. You're a colony of Christ. You're a people like the church of Philippi, like these little house churches that are like these little um, candles in darkness in a dark world. You guys are are a colony within a colony. You're a colony of the kingdom. And just like the Roman colony in Philippi was bringing Roman culture to the world, you are a colony of heaven bringing the culture of heaven to earth. You tracking? So when he writes that, it might mean, when he says citizens and your citizenship is in heaven, it means something a little different to them. He's, He's saying you guys are bringing the culture of heaven. And a lot of times in that culture, and I think even in ours, we can make a mistake and we can think, okay, well, if we're citizens in heaven, it means that we just sit here waiting in the dark until the day that God glorifies our humble bodies and God brings us into heaven. So heaven's like out there and we're just waiting here in the dark and we're just kind of like gritting it out. We need to be safe and protect ourselves. We need to shut people out and let's stay away from the evil Roman, Gentile, Greek culture or the culture that we live in. We just need to hunker down and we just need to be a colony that's safe, secure, and separate. And Paul, he, as you read his thought, his thinking, what he means by our citizenship is in heaven is not just some future reality. It is that, but it's also a now reality. The future defines our present. The end game determines our now game. Do you guys track with that? So Paul is, is he's reminding them and he's reminding us that we are current citizens of heaven, bringing heaven's culture now. That's why Jesus said on earth, in the Lord's prayer, on earth, here, as it is in heaven. So if that's true, I think it's really important that, that we understand that Paul says in Philippians 2, you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation, then you will shine among them like stars in a dark world. That means we're citizens of heaven and we're ambassadors of heaven. We are citizens of hope and we are ambassadors of hope. Ambassadors, uh, what's the difference between citizens and ambassadors? Citizens like are building the homestead, staying at home, staying within the walls, sacred, safe, separate. But we're also ambassadors because we're, we're part of a colony that's spreading out the kingdom of God. So ambassadors represent a king, their kingdom to another kingdom. Ambassadors of hope and heaven and Jesus are, are representing that kingdom of hope, heaven and Jesus into a dark world. Our light is supposed to shine. And in a world that's filled with fear right now and challenge that comes wave upon wave. Have you noticed like looking at the news and the the world news, there's just wave upon wave of challenges and fear that can hit us. It's like the shore of our reality, wave upon wave, that we are people that stand in faith and hope and not in fear. And it's such a good reminder and it frees us to have faith. It frees us 
to have hope in a hopeless world, in a fearful world. Often it's easy to forget whose colony we belong to, become more afraid of the things around us and worry about protecting ourselves rather than being the citizens and ambassadors sent into a broken world. We believe, well, our mission statement, part of our mission statement here at Whitewater is Jesus has sent us. Jesus sends us into a broken world. We're sent to bless a broken world. Like that's our purpose. Not to be selfish, not to be focused on ourselves, not to be fearful, but to bless others. A life of faith. So that means that the church was made for times like this. Not to be afraid of times like this. The church is made for the you and I gathered here. We're made for times like this. So let me ask you, what would it look like for this church, this group gathered here at the first service, second service, and even those who are online watching, what would it look like for us to be a colony of light and hope? I'm going to give you guys 60 seconds to talk among yourselves, just for a moment. If you're uh, an introvert, it's only 60 seconds. If you're an extrovert, it's only 60 seconds, okay? So just take a moment. But answer this question. How would you describe the difference between reacting to challenges with fear versus faith? What, what is that, what's the difference? What do you notice when we as people or people around you or you yourself react in fear versus faith? Ready, go. All right. Fear versus faith. Hope versus hopelessness. You see kind of the polarization when, when, when challenges and fear and needs hit our world. You know, it's like the difference of bathing in Purell, uh, you know, um, and, and, and being able to walk around like, oh, I'm wash my hands, I can be confident. Uh, I've got kids, like I understand, like the, my son goes around, you know, eating things off the ground and like that, <gasps> you get that, Ugh. I remember I was on the plane in Africa like a month ago and you know, like when you're on the plane, there's, there's you know, there's different senses of, uh, globally, there's different senses of, you know, of hygiene and sanitation and, and, uh, and there can be moments where you're just like, is, is this clean, is this safe? And, and the fear can start to take over, it's kind of like the snowball effect, but I I want to remind us today of who we are as citizens of heaven. Can I get, I'm going to give us a few pictures, a few snapshots of the church um, that we, I think we can look back to. And one of them is, is this, it gives us some direction on how the church has dealt with tough times, what the church is, what we are called to be together as a people of heaven and hope. Here's a quote uh, for you guys. This is in 140 uh, AD. So this is really early church. This is an anonymous letter sent to a guy named Diognesis. He was a governor. It was sent to him by someone, an anonymous person, on behalf of the church, describing the impact of the church in some of the biggest challenges, biggest sicknesses, biggest problems that faced that culture at that time. Check this out. It says this, for Christians cannot be distinguished from the rest of the human race by country or language or customs because Christians have all kinds of customs and all kinds of languages. You don't have to be in a certain ethnicity to be a Christian. That was baffling back then. They live in their own countries, but only as aliens because they're citizens in heaven. They busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. Keep reading. What the soul is to the body. Now think about the church. This church, we gather, you guys know, and then we scatter to bless our broken world. What the soul is to the body, that Christians are in the world. The soul is dispersed through all the members of the body. And Christians are scattered through all the cities of the world. What the soul is to the body, the church is for a broken world. Think about that. And as the body is struggling, as the, if sickness or pain or hurt and fear are facing the world around us, we are the soul, like the body of Christ, he's saying is like the soul that inhabits and fills and brings hope and life and joy. And it's so easy to let full pull us back to safety, security, and, and, and it's about us. But we are citizens and ambassadors of heaven and hope. Imagine how many leaders in our church, just our one church, not let alone other churches, but just this church, 
Imagine how many leaders we have scattered throughout the world right now. Leaders working in hospitals, leaders working in schools and education, leaders working in businesses, leaders working in the government, leaders um, that are out in neighborhoods, stewarding people, stewarding resources, taking care of, managing, um, caring for people and human resources. Think about um, how many leaders are, um, that, that are Christian, that are Jesus followers, or learning to be Jesus followers, are making decisions or influencing decisions that are impacting the health and well-being of our culture here in the Northwest. Think about that. The church is like the soul to the body for our world. And if the, if the soul starts to pull away from the body, the body's not gonna live. That's what they're saying. It's a little bit of Greek Gnosticism in there. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Um, this is why our vision as a sent and scattered church to bless a broken world is so important. If, if that isn't our vision, instead of serving and a hurting and scared and broken world together as ambassadors of heaven, our mission becomes merely making our homes and our lives and our gatherings safe, for ourselves while we pay no attention to a world that's afraid and dying without Christ. And I get it. I get the fear. I, my son picks something off off the ground. Even before all this mess, there's that part of me that's like, Ugh! I get, I, you know, is that safe? Is that, is that been, is that sanitized? It's so easy to be fearful and focus on ourselves at the expense of a world that we have been sent to bless. Amen? I've shortchanged the gospel. We shortchanged the gospel and the mission of Christ if all we do is think about how to make ourselves and our church gathering flourish at the expense of our community flourishing. We've separated the soul from the body. And God has, what God has joined together, let nobody separate. And God has sent us. Jesus said that. John chapter 20, verse 21. As the Father sent me, so I send you. So, the church is made for this. Not to be afraid of this. How do we live as a colony of heaven? How do we live as ambassadors of heaven? Let's take a cue from Paul, writing in Philippians uh, three seventeen. We're kind of following his thinking on ambassadors and citizens of heaven, and what that looks like to be a church scattered in the Roman Empire and, or the world we find ourselves, and to be a scattered church shining light in the darkness. He says this in verse seventeen: "Brothers and sisters, become imitators of me, and watch those who live this way." You can use us as models. I love how, he, how Paul communicates that. It's so clear. It's so important. We make faith so complicated. We make faith like about certain doctrinal confessions and having like our, you know, having to have a certain amount of uh, knowledge and intelligence uh, about God to be accepted by God. And, and Paul, Paul, as we'll find out next week, any time we try to relate to God or make our relationship right with God through our work or our knowledge or our intelligence or something that we are trying to earn and merit, we've missed it. We don't understand the good news is that no, 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 no. You can't do that for yourself because Jesus has already done it for you. He made us right with God through his life, his sacrifice, and his resurrection. The power that raised him is now accessible as power for us because of Jesus. And But at the, Paul is saying, so faith becomes a life of faith, becomes imitation, becomes modeling ourselves, having eyes to see where God is at work, where his spirit is at work. Discipleship, faith is following godly Jesus like models, examples. So I think it's really true that to be signs of hope, we have to see signs of hope. You might want to put that down on your notes, to see signs of hope. We have, to be signs of hope, we have to see signs of hope. It would also be true to be models of hope for others. We have to see models of hope. Faith, we make it so complicated and like a lot of times we make discipleship about, um, primarily about doctrine, primarily about programs. Discipleship is about discovering God in our lives in real time and responding to that. 
over and over and over. It's not like some perfect program. Paul doesn't just say like, hey, the church in Philippi, here's the six weeks of how you get your life perfectly figured out. Now, those can be very helpful. I'm not trying to put that down. But we have to understand primarily, like, like faith is about responding to the work we see God doing in the world and who we see him. And Paul's saying, follow my example. I'm not perfect, but follow my example. God's not looking for perfect disciples, but growing disciples. He says, look at other people like me, like Timothy or Epaphroditus. Remember the guy with the name that sounds like a disease? He's actually a good guy. Follow his example. Find people like them. Uh, the models that you imitate. My son is an imitation machine. That's how he learns. In families, I think it's true. And in life, I think it's true. What we become is more caught than taught. It's more caught than taught. Like, like we just learn by being around, by being immersed in relationship and in families and in workplaces. My son, like, uh, the, like an example would be me when I greet my dog. He's a French bulldog. His name's Whiskey, and uh, he's, re- he's got a lot of energy. And I'll fight with him, and I'll pull him up, and then I'll, I'll slide him. I'll kind of throw him on, like, on our, like, not throw him, throw him, but, like, slide him on the wood. We have these, like, wood floors, and he'll go, and then he'll, like, slowly come back, and then it's a good way of burning the energy. And, uh, and my, my boy will, all of a sudden, I'll, I'll walk up and he'll like run into whiskey and bury his head and try to do the same things I was doing. And he'll, and, and he'll try to push and slide whiskey, but he's not heavy enough, so whiskey will slide him. You know, he's just imitating me. He's a, and he, he watches me. I have to be careful of that because um, he imitates everything, everything. Paul says, faith is simple. A life of faith, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Find models. And well, how do we do that? What does that look like? And Paul teaches that. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Again, if we follow this thread through his letter, he teaches how do you see signs and models of hope to to be models of hope. From now on, he says in verse 8, chapter 4, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent, if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. So easy to focus on what's wrong. So easy to focus on where God isn't and where the problem is and and what's what's going horribly wrong in the world. And, And to look at people who are really messed up and be like, man, they're so messed up. And Paul says, you're focusing on the wrong things. Faith is having eyes to see where God is at work in the ordeal, not just the ideal. We all have an ideal. God has an ideal, but God sent his son to work in the ordeal, the problems. Do we have eyes to see where the spirit of God is at work in different people that we can learn from? This means you can learn from anybody. Focus your thoughts on these things. He even goes more into it. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, all that is worthy of praise. Focus on these things and practice these things. Whatever you've learned, received, heard, or saw in us, practice them, learn them. And I love this verse, the God of peace will be with you as you focus and follow. Do you know guys know that we, we follow what we focus on? Focus our eyes where there is hope, signs of hope, where God's leading through leaders and people and places, situations, and practice these things. And God's with you. We don't have to freak out as much as we might want to, as much as I might want to. I don't have to freak out. I don't have to panic. I might have many panics, many freak outs, but I can be like, when that happens, I can breathe. It's okay. It's okay. God's in control. He's good. He loves us. He's a good father. He went, he's bringing heaven to earth and the brokenness and the ordeal. He's bringing the kingdom of God. And when it looks really dark, the sun will rise. The light will shine brighter. And we can trust him. Amen? So can I give you two models of hope from the church. I think when Paul says, look at models, look at models from the past and then look at models right now. Look at signs of hope and signs of the spirit in the past. So we we can learn from the church. I think it's wise to learn from other people, even in the past. And then also presently. So let's look at two models of, of hope. The church at its best being citizens and ambassadors. Um, Lewis Mumford noted in the first century, 
this about Christians. So this first century um, observation about churches. Instead of escaping the ugly realities of their time, the Christians embraced them. Oh, we can learn from this. Next one. By doing willingly what the pagan non-believers diligently avoided, diligently avoided, the Christians both neutralized and in some measure overcame the forces that threatened them. Now, check this out. This is really, really key. Christians visited the sick. Christians comforted the widow and the orphan. Uh, Christians redeemed the disgraces of starvation, sickness, and squalor in their world by making them an opportunity for fellowship and love. When everybody in the Roman Empire, all the leaders, all the governors, all the statutes, uh, all the, they call pagan thinking or non-Christian thinkers, were running away from the problems of the world because God has sent his people to scatter and be a blessing. The Christians were running to the places where they could help, where they could shine light, where they had expertise, or they had calling. The Christians were running and filling a dark world with little colonies of light, colonies of the kingdom. Amen? Man, I think that's cool. Christians would even collect bodies that have been thrown in the garbage and, and individually bury their bodies and honor them and clean their cities. We, we, we have so much infrastructure and the Christians living back then had like very little infrastructure and, the, and they stepped up to bless their world. Let me give you another snapshot from history, another model of hope that we can learn from. Uh, during the second century, the church grew and spread in Egypt. It grew because female leaders and deacons in cities in Egypt went up and down the streets collecting unwanted babies abandoned at night. This was a common ancient practice, a form of infanticide and abortion often in public squares under pagan idols and statues. These incredible church women provided nursing mothers who nursed uh, the abandoned children, bathed them, and raised them. The early church of Egypt responded to this crisis by developing a seek and save baby ministry. Man, if that's not ambassadors of heaven, I don't know what is. Instead of being afraid and running or doing nothing, the, the, the church responded with people who had vision and calling for it. History shows that a spirit-empowered, Jesus-trusting church spreads faster than any infection. So how do we respond? I want to close with that. How do we respond as a church, as a community? What do we focus on? And I, we, we do need to be wise and prudent you know, personally and, and as our gathering, we need to be wise and prudent when anything like this or, uh, does or will come up in the future. But we need to also have our eyes set on the people that God wants us to bless. We have been sent, we have been scattered. So I, there's, a, there's a word that Paul wrote to Timothy Remember Timothy from last week? This is his disciple, his leader. And he speaks a word to Timothy, and I think it speaks directly to us today. 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 through 7, says this. Therefore, I remind you, Timothy, to rekindle the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul's reminding him, remember the day that I, I commissioned you, I prayed for you, and I, I called out the gifts in you, and remember the gifts that I recognize that you have that are unique to you. No one else has the gift mix you do, right? You have been given those gifts for such a time as this, Timothy. We don't know what he was facing. We, don't, we know that there, there was some reason for him to have fear, and Paul says, don't hide your gifts now. Let them shine out. This is what you've been sent for. This is what I commissioned you. Remember the gifts that God has given you. Verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, of love, and sound judgment. Amen. That's a word for us today. I think it's so important. God's gifts of hope surface where hope is disappearing. God has given every person in here calling. He's given every person in here gifts to be a blessing for times like this, not to run from times like this. 
This is when the watching world is looking to see what do these Christians really believe? What is so good about the news that Jesus might exist, might have died and been raised to life? What is, this is when the watching world is watching. And so I wanna remind you with these four things. The first is rekindle the gifts of God. God's gifts of hope surface where hope is disappearing. A spirit of fear diminishes those gifts. And right now is the time to let those gifts shine. Whatever gifts and calling God is giving, let them shine out for him. The next thing is power. That we're to step out empowered by God. That we have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. is the same spirit that lives in us who follow Jesus. We're led by that spirit. We're empowered by that spirit. We're encouraged by that spirit. And I think it's one of the most powerful ways we, we demonstrate that is the empowering presence of, of God, the Spirit, is through prayer. That we are a praying people and we recognize that, that God can help hopeless situations. That he can help us when we're afraid to do things we are too afraid to do on our own. And I want to raise a few people that we should be praying for and I want to take a moment to pray for them. First is we need to be praying for all those who are sick or impacted, family members that are impacted by the sickness going around right now. Or family members whose loved ones are serving in those areas. They've been, they're not with their families because they're serving and they're in the medical field and they're helping and they're giving their gifts that God has given them. Even people who don't yet know God, God has given them those gifts. That's where their gifts come from. That's where their life comes from. And this is what they're for. And God is using them without them knowing it yet to do the things he's made them to do. And we need to be praying that as they're serving him, they're realizing this isn't just for me. Like, I'm not just this, like, phone that exists without, you know, plugging into the energy and, and source of life. We point people back to Jesus. Like, the gifts you have are from him. Here's the other thing. I mentioned this earlier. We have leaders scattered in the education world, in classrooms, in medical world, in healthcare areas, in hospitals, um, all kinds of gifts that are serving right now. We have people, leaders, in government positions, People in business positions, they're still working, still helping our society function. Government leaders, education leaders, making decisions that affect thousands of people's well-being and health. We should be praying for them. I mean, we want our church to be safe, and we're, we, we are taking precautions as a church, and I I'm, I'm encourage anybody and everybody to have sound judgment with that. But we need to be praying that we out there are blessing our world. So... How many of you guys are in education that are here? Anybody in the world of education? Thank you for your service. How about government? Government leaders? Thank you. Like you guys are making major decisions. How about um, business world? Like you're still helping world function when the world wants to stop functioning. Um, how, about, um, how about medical? Medical workers? Okay, so what I'm going to do is, that we don't always do this, but I think it's important. I'm going to have you stand, and we're going to pray for you, okay? And I'm going to pray for anybody who's affected. So if you're a teacher, would you stand up so we can see our stand-up teachers, educators, stand up. You guys are awesome. Thank you. You guys are sent to bless a broken world. Um, government workers, would you stand up? Or public servants, if that, you know, police or firemen, stand on up. Um, Wow, thank you. You're sent to bless a broken world. How about um, healthcare? If you're in the healthcare world, would you stand up? Could we all agree that these are pretty important people right now? You guys are facing a lot of things that many of us would never face. Questions, decisions. Thank you, you're sent to bless a broken world. Anybody else that like, you, 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 your calling is, is in the midst of this fear right now. Go ahead and stand up and I'm gonna pray specifically for you. Let's pray for them together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these called ones. We pray that you would use them to bless our broken world. In the season of fear and in sickness, God, would you use them, help them make wise decisions, help them to have sound judgment, help them to love people, and help them to have a spirit of power, not a spirit of fear. And God, we pray for any families, any person that's affected by the illness and sickness. We pray for uh, the vulnerable. We pray that you'd keep them safe. And God, would you give us great wisdom and faith in this time as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give those people a hand? Thank you. 
Let me finish this out with the last two things. Power, love, and sound judgment. Number three is love. Just be aware and care. Aware and care. Just think about that. If we're going to be a church that's scattered in different neighborhoods, different workplaces, to be thinking, where, where maybe are there vulnerable people? And from what I've read about some of the illness that's going around is that the most vulnerable are people who are, are sick and their, their immune systems are compromised or elderly. And so think about that. Are there people that are vulnerable, fit in that category in your neighborhood, your community, your condo, that you could bless somehow Sim- in simple ways? Just check in on them. Take care of them. Are there people in your workplace or um, in your friend group or family group that's like, oh, you know, I need to check in. And maybe it's simple ways, you know, like sending a text, you know, that's, you know, a very easy and uh, great way of checking in without like having to be present with someone if they don't want anybody near them. You can just text in, how are you doing? You could do, you, uh, I had a friend who said, get, get gift cards and just drop them off. And maybe some people that might be vulnerable and let them know if they need anything, we are here for you. If you go to the grocery store and you're shopping, te- text the, you know, because, because hopefully you've got their number. And if not, get their number and text them and just say, hey, I'm picking up groceries. Do you need any? Can I get you some groceries? Be generous. This is our opportunity to be the citizens of heaven. Amen? And lastly, have sound judgment. Have sound judgment. Follow sound medical recommendations for public health and safety. I mean, it's just a no-brainer, but like, let's, be, let's have sound, wise judgment and encourage that in others and teach that with our kids and maybe with people who don't, don't have those practices in their life. We can, we can be teachers in that and models in that. And this will unleash the scattered church to shine among a dark world like stars. Not a spirit of fear, a spirit of power, love, and sound judgment. And that's my encouragement to us today as a church. Let's be the church, citizens of heaven on earth, ambassadors of heaven here on earth. We were made for this, not to be afraid of this. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We're so grateful for you. We ask for your blessing. As we worship today, as we finish our service today, and <clears throat> I pray that we would walk out inspired to follow you, inspired to follow the models of the early church that can teach us so many lessons about hope and hopelessness, about faith where everyone's afraid. And God, I pray that we would love people deeply. That it wouldn't just be like, I don't know, just boxes we're checking to be Christians or a to-do list, God, that we would out of love have eyes to see the signs of hope. In Jesus' name, amen.